hands as you may be seated. I want you to do something this morning I call on you quite frequently to do. And that is, I want you to use your sanctified imagination. I want you to take yourself back in time. And it's sometime during the first century. And you're a prisoner. You've been captured by Roman soldiers. You've been dragged from your native country. You've been sold as a slave. And you have been stripped, you've been whipped, you've been branded, you've been imprisoned, and you have been treated with shameful cruelty. And at long last, you have been appointed to die in the amphitheater. You're going to make sport and celebrate a holiday for a tyrant. The Colosseum is filled. The people of the city have gathered with delight and anticipation and tens of thousands are assembled there in the arena. They're looking down at you from the sides of the Colosseum. And there you are on the floor of the Colosseum. You're naked. You're alone. And you're armed only with a single dagger in your hand. Admittedly, a very poor weapon against gigantic beasts. And then you hear the sounds of a massive door being drawn up by machinery. And from deep within the caverns of the Colosseum, a huge lion appears and rushes to the floor of the Colosseum. The king of beasts. And you have a choice. You can slay the lion or you can be torn to pieces. You've got only a dagger. And you realize that the fight is going to be more than you can handle. You know before it starts what the outcome is going to be. Those terrible teeth are going to rip your flesh to shreds and be dripping with your blood. Unexpectedly, something quite amazing happens. A deliverer appears. A great unknown comes down out of the crowd in the Colosseum and confronts this savage beast of prey. This stranger does not cower or tremble or back up from the roaring of the lion. Instead, he leaps upon that lion and with a terrible fury grabs that lion and beats that lion until like a whipped cur, that lion slinks away toward his den, dragging himself along in pain and fear. And the hero comes over and he lifts you up. And he looks into your bloodless face and whispers in your ear and says, Rejoice! You are now free. Do you have this picture in your mind? If you were in that situation, wouldn't you want to know who your deliverer was? Wouldn't you want to know who it was that saved you from being ripped to shreds by the king of beasts? What would your first question be? As the guards turned you loose on the open street outside the Colosseum, taking your first breath of fresh, free air, wouldn't you want to know who it was that delivered you? And yet no one can inform you who it was that saved you. You are, however, led away to a great mansion. And there at that great mansion, your wounds are washed and they're healed with the most powerful ointment. And you're dressed in the finest clothing and you sit down to a feast like you've never seen before in your life. You go to bed that night. And then you sleep on a mattress more luxurious than you ever knew existed. 
And the next morning you awake and you're taken care of by servants. And they guard you. And they minister to your good. And they take care of your every need, your every whim, your every desire. Day after day, week after week, all of your wants are supplied. And you're living now like a member of the aristocracy. There's nothing you ask that you do not receive. Would you be a bit curious? Would your curiosity at this point not grow till it was an insatiable craving? And at every opportunity you'd say to one of the servants, tell me who it is. Tell me who's providing all of this. Tell me who is my benefactor. I need to know my benefactor. Have I imagined any thoughts or any emotions in this that would be unnatural? I don't think so. You see, it's because Jesus loved me. And it's because Jesus gave himself for me that I want to know Jesus. Because he shed his blood for me, my soul desires to have a fuller acquaintance with him. John chapter 15 and verse 13 reads, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. The great tragedy of our day and time is there are so many in our age, so many right here, right now, so many in our world today who are content to live without knowing Jesus Christ. And we're not just talking about the alien sinner. We're not just talking about the ungodly. We're not just talking about the profane. But there are all over the length and breadth of this great nation of ours, there are in our community saints of God who are outer court worshipers. People who are strangers to a burning, insatiable desire to know Jesus Christ. You remember the words of David in Psalm 42, and verse 1? As the heart panteth after the water's brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth after thee. When shall I come and appear before God? When David talks about the heart in Psalm 42, he's not talking about this pump that sends the blood coursing through the veins of my body. He's not talking about the biblical heart, the mind of man. He's talking about the H-A-R-T, the heart. The very finest of the red deer, the pick of the herd of the red deer. As the red deer panteth after the water's brook. After that red deer has such an insatiable desire for the cool, refreshing mountain stream after being heated in the chase. David said, So is my soul overwhelmed for thee, O God, and for thy refreshing grace. As the heart panteth after the water's brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Beloved, in our day and time, there are myriads of people who have no panting in their heart to know Jesus. Paul would write in the Philippian letter in chapter 3 as he wrote to that beloved church in Philippi. And he tells them about his pedigree and the Jewish faith and about what an up-and-comer he was and what a Pharisee he was and all the accolades that came his way. And he said, but everything in my former life and everything I've ever done, he said, I count it but dumb that I might win Christ and that I may know him and the power of resurrection. 
Jesus said, that I, or Paul said, that I may know Jesus Christ. There are many who say with Paul today that they want to win Jesus. They want to know Jesus. They want to be found in Jesus. But this higher wish, they want to win Jesus. They want to be found in Him. But this higher, greater wish, this desire to know Jesus intimately and personally has not yet stirred deep inside their hearts. How many people do we know? How many men and women on the footstool of God Almighty today are content to know the historic life of Jesus? He was born of a virgin and, a man, and laid in a manger in a stall because the hotel rooms were all full. And he walked up and down the dusty roads of Palestine. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He made the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear. And knowing the historic life of Jesus, they're content with that and that alone. People who read the gospel stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're charmed with the perfect beauty of Jesus' history. They know all the incidents of His life from the manger to the cross. But sadly, Tragically, regrettably, they do not know Jesus. People who know the life of Christ, but don't know Christ's life. They admire His way among men. And yet admiring His way among men, do not see Jesus as the way. When Jesus called His disciples to Him, and he was told that he was going to go away. He said, if I go, I'll come and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there he might be also. Thomas said, Lord, we know not where thou goest. How can we know the way? And in John 14, verse 6, what did Jesus tell Thomas and the others? He said, I am the way. I am the way. The truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father. And there are still others today. They know the doctrine of Christ. They know all of His teachings. They prize the teachings of Jesus. But they do not know Jesus. People that are ready to go anywhere, anytime, and debate anyone on the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus taught is near and dear to them, and they're instructed well in all the doctrines of Jesus Christ. But they know that while they know the doctrines of Jesus Christ, they don't know the heart of Jesus Christ. There are people who know his example. They know his sacrifice. And yet they don't know Jesus. We must not. We cannot. Me and you, we, us. We cannot stop short of knowing Jesus in our spirituality. How many are there in our world today that have heard of Jesus? And that's enough for them. How many have read of Jesus and that satisfies them? That should not be enough for us. When Paul wrote his last letter to Timothy, and he's bringing it to a close, he did not say, I have heard of him on whom I have believed. And Paul did not say, I have read of him on whom I believed. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. It was personal with Paul. He knew Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I know what I believe. I know what I believe in. I know who I believe. I know whom I have believed. 
before said. And I'm persuaded he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We must not, we cannot be content. We cannot be satisfied until we know Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? What are you talking about, Tim? What does it mean to know Jesus? What does it mean for Jesus to be our friend? When we know someone, we're acquainted with what they do, aren't we? We know what they live for, what makes them tick, so to speak. I know Jesus Christ as a cleanser because Jesus Christ cleansed me from the stain of sin. Have you ever taken something to the cleaners and it's got a spot of suit or maybe you ladies take a dress. I've taken lots of suits with a spot and I always tell them, I say, now this right here is spaghetti sauce or this is brown gravy. This is Thousand Island salad dressing. Whatever it might be. But occasionally I've taken a suit or a pair of slacks to the cleaners, told them about the spot, they've treated it, and I get my clothes and there's a little disclaimer attached to the hanger that says we weren't able to get all the spots out. As good as the cleaners might be, sometimes they can't get your clothes completely clean, but Jesus Christ can get you completely clean. It doesn't matter what I've done. It doesn't matter how dark the stain of sin might be. I know Jesus Christ cleanses me from sin. I know that Jesus has forgiven my sins. And when I think of the Son of God, God Himself humbling Himself and coming to this earth to dwell among men and live as I do and you do, it means most to me when I realize that Jesus leaving His throne of glory and coming to this earth allows me to be possible for me to have the forgiveness of my sins. But I know Jesus is more than a cleanser. I know Jesus as a clover. You know, I can remember many, many years ago when Bell's department store would put their men's suits on sale for $75 a suit or two for $100. But to get the two for $100 special, you had to buy two suits. My granddaddy and I would make a trip to Bell's apartment store and we'd buy a suit apiece so we could get a $50 suit. And I remember how thrilled I was one day when I went to Bradbury's men's store and bought me a hammock that was more than $50. And I remember the day that I was able to catch a really good sale and I bought a hard Schaffner and Mark suit. But you know what? I go to dealers sometimes to some of the bigger stores in Houston and they carry a brand of suit there you don't find on the rack in Tyler or Street Porter. Long view. They carry a Dickie Freeman suit. We were there looking at suits one day, and I was looking. Norma goes along and she looks at the suits and sees which ones are pretty. And I'm looking at the sleeves to see which ones have the mark down price on them. And she had him hold one up and she said, This is a pretty suit. I didn't even look at the sleeve. I looked at the suit. I said, Yeah, it ought to be pretty. It's a Hickey Freeman. She said, What do you mean it's a Hickey Freeman? I said, Look at the tag. $1,995 for that suit. I didn't pay that much for the first car I ever bought. <coughs> I've never yet had one of those, Leon. And I think the only way I will is if one of my boys decides to buy it for me someday. Here's my point. Jesus has clothed me with something finer than a Hickey Freeman suit from dinner. Jesus has clothed me in a garment of righteousness. He cleansed me from sin. He washed away all of my spots and He clothed me in righteousness. I know Him as a clother. I know Him as a cleanser. And I know Him as a shepherd. 
because I am one of his sheep. And because Jesus Christ is my redeemer, my clother, my cleanser, and my shepherd, because Jesus is my friend, and because I know Jesus Christ, my life has purpose. My life has plan, a plan. You know, in spite of all of the achievements that men make sometimes in life, man sometimes is like a cork bobbing on top of the water, just bobbing along here and there. And men and men and women often leave little more behind when life is over than you leave behind when you than you do when you plunge your finger into a glass of water. And for all of his achievements, for all of his advancements, the majority of men and women on the footstool of God this morning lead a life void of real purpose and real meaning. But when we come to know Jesus Christ, for those who come to know Jesus and for those who will let him, for those who will open his heart, their hearts to him, Jesus Christ can change this meaningless, purposeless manner of living into a rich, meaningful, joyful existence. Because knowing Jesus, knowing Him as our friend, it brings peace of mind to our lives. Probably one of the most desired and one of the most elusive achievements in our world today. Peace of mind. But the promises of God contained in this book constitute a foundation upon which we can build a life. A life free from fear. A life free from anxiety. That's not to say this world is not a dangerous place. Oh, it is a dangerous place. It is to say the promises of God Enable us to face danger without being overcome by it. The promises of God are the antidote to anxiety and fear. Paul would write to that beloved Philippian church in the fourth chapter, verses six and seven, and he said, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now listen to it. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will dwell in your hearts through Christ Jesus. To have Jesus as your friend is to have the confidence of an eternal home. I told you about the last conversation with my mother. We thought she was comatose. She was laying there in a hospital bed. The hospice people, Matt was on one side of the bed, I was on the other side of the bed, Mom was at the foot of the bed. I thought I detected a change, and I said to Matt, I said, you got your stopwatch, son? He said, yes. I said, check her breathing pattern. She hadn't talked to us in over a couple, two or three hours. By the said, we thought she was coming though. She opened her eyes, she looked at me, and she said, you're timing me to see how long it takes me to go. I said, Mother, are you going somewhere? Yes, I am. I said, where are you going, Mom? She said, I'm going to be with God. Now, the humorous part of that story is that I said, are you sure about that? She looked at me and she said, that's where I'm going. I don't know about you. But think about that confidence. Ten minutes later, she took her very last breath on this earth. The last words she ever spoke. Are you going somewhere? I'm going to be with God. To know Jesus Christ as my friend is to have the confidence 
of my eternal home. Jesus says, greater love has no man than it is to be laid down his life for his friends. The last part of that passage, Jesus says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Among the last things Jesus said to his disciples was in John 14. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you might be also. When temptation threatens to overwhelm us. When the world is closing in on us. When we're disheartened and we're discouraged, it's a great help to think in terms of Jesus preparing a heavenly home for those who are his friends, who have obeyed his will and live his kind of life. That gives a new realization. that we're very important. Sometimes we feel very worthless. Sometimes we feel very insignificant. But I'm important enough, and you're important enough, that Jesus has gone to heaven to prepare us a place to come and be with him. Now here's the question. Do you know Jesus this morning? Are you a friend of Jesus? I'm not asking you if you know about him. I'm asking you if you really know him. I wish I knew how to introduce you to you. Because if you've never yet come to Jesus, for you, Jesus has not come. Over the last 52 years, I have wished thousands and thousands of times that I really knew how to make Jesus Christ real. that I can make him real enough that people would take his death for sin seriously. Real enough that people would take their responsibility to him earnestly. Real enough that people would pant like the heart to know Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Is he Lord and Master of your life? If not, would you come this morning and make him Lord and Master of your life? It's his invitation.